I think in my birth there was a computer mistake. I should have something wrong programming. I should have landed here rather than there. It took me 20 years to get back home here. India had been in my upbringing and in my life. I, I feel fortunate. I feel privileged. To be in India, to be a foreigner in India, that's been, that's been able and has been allowed to make it my home. When my husband died in 1976, cancer, and people asked me, are you going back to England? <laughs> I was quite amazed that anybody should even suggest it. Because India was my home, and India is my home, and I just love it. I miss, I miss the noises and the smells. Everything's very acute here. And when, once you get sort of hooked on that, it's, it's, uh, it's really hard to, to enjoy other places. By foreignness, in one way, people are more attracted to, for example, a man who is a para from Europe or a, or a commander from Europe. Or... Sometimes in a village, you know, people would say, Angres, Angres. But it's not said in an in a unpleasant manner. It's just said to show the, that, you know, you're different which uh, actually uh, was more felt by the people than by myself. I felt very much uh, part of it all from the, from the beginning. I have now spent, if I take my childhood, 40 out of the 60 odd years I've lived in this country. So it's probably the natural place for me to be, really. What is it about India that inspires so many to discover it? To try and understand it? It seems to possess that elusive quality of a long ago legend, which in turn possesses countless others to sift through its very many nuances. Explore the myth and the vision, only to discover that it is real, present, and also pervasive. Probably because somewhere along the way the myth and the vision give way and become a geographic and economic entity. The bundle of contradictions unfold from a paradox into a cultural unity amidst diversity. A multi-layered, mini-textured reality. Enriched over time by explorers and travelers, traders and even plunderers. Armies accumulating wealth and territory for their king. People seeking refuge from religious persecution. Wise men in search of knowledge and wisdom. Students, holy men preaching to convert. Finally, by an imperial power to become a jewel in its crown. A process so self-perpetuating that each initiating yet more to come. To discover, to understand, and then to make it their own. India is a very good training for becoming wider than just one's own nation. There is an aspect of um, beyond nationality in India. There is something which is um, from the soul quality, from the inner quality. There is something which I have not encountered anywhere. If you walk around New York, you see all nations represented there. It's also something of, you know, uh, international ambience. But this is a kind of um, external internationalism. India has uh, an inner universal or international strength and power to which people are attracted. They feel it is not cancelling their own nationality but widening it. No? I don't think that in India one ever feels uh, this ostracized if you're a foreigner. I think um, Indian, uh, Indians are largely 
uh, used to, uh, to seeing people uh, from all walks of life and the whole history of India has been a succession of foreigners coming and settling down in this country. So I think it's very much um, in, in the mind of the, in the Indian psyche that, uh, you know, to be open to, to, to foreign, uh, uh, you know, influences and foreign uh, look at life, etc. India is uh, like a salad, uh, whereas America is like a melting pot. And what is the difference between those two? A melting pot, everyone gets put into it, boiled up together, and a sort of sludge emerges out of it. A salad, everyone is there side by side, your tomato, your cucumber, your lettuce, your uh, whatever else it is. But they all remain a cucumber, a tomato, a lettuce. You don't boil it all up and make this sludge. This confluence of influences and an inherent ability to nourish whatever is sown into its soil, along with the freedom to attain its full potential, is what India has been associated with through the millennia and even today. I feel that uh, it's the diversity and the richness of India's tradition as well as modernity that is what's so exciting about it. I mean, it's often said that we live in many centuries at the same time, even millennia. And that is one of the greatest things about India. That's something that I love and that I miss tremendously when I'm away from this country. Not only our civilization is wonderful, I mean, it's a, such an old, it's probably the oldest living civilization today. Our spirituality is the oldest living spirituality today. Uh, our medicine, medical system, you know, the, uh, it's the oldest medical system still practiced today, you know. Our breathing techniques, the pranayama, is the oldest, you know, there's nothing else left in the world. I mean, all the great civilizations have come, they have gone, you know. They had knowledge, they had, you know, techniques, but it's all gone, you know, it's all, you know, in, the, in history. A land where things come together in a very remarkable way. I mean, one of the things which fascinates me most about India is the religions of India and the way that uh, they have this history of living together in a way which is quite remarkable when you think of the religious wars and strifes that there have been in the West and indeed in other parts of the world. Again, India is a land where people of different ethnic origins come together and somehow live together. India is a land where people speaking many different languages live together without feeling the need necessarily to change those languages or anything like that. So I think India is a land of great variety which somehow or other holds together. However, it is this very diversity in form and spirit, compounded with an inability to fathom it, that gives birth to misconceptions about India outside of it. What follows is not just a selective perception, but even more selective portrayal, encouraging more ambiguity and myths. I, th I think uh, the problem is that foreigners have very uh, stereotype uh, images about India. You know, they've heard of, of India, those who have not visited India. Of course, when, once they've come, 
uh, they realize that it's very, very different from the image that is for some reason projected uh, in the West or outside India, by the, largely by the press, actually. When you come to India, you don't I mean, you come with all these cliches and prejudice. yourself, you know, are part of that prejudice. So, so because I have lived in India a long time, because I'm married to an Indian, because I've traveled all over this country, you know, and I feel an empathy for the people, I, you know, I, I start thinking like them and seeing in their way. Then I realize how, what a negative image India has abroad and how much she suffers, how much India suffers from that negative image. Even economically, I mean, people are not investing in India, the Western nation, because of that negative image of India. I have been criticized sometimes for my reporting on India, and certainly the BBC, which I used to work for, was often criticized when I worked for it. Um, and I have written books, which have not been by any means uh, wholly uncritical of India. Because th your editors ask for all these negative things. You know, basically, they're interested you know, in negative output from India. So they, there's a lot of pressure on you, you know, to do, whether it's politically, you know, whether it's to, to report on catastrophes, to report on corruption, to report. So it's very difficult for a journalist to work in India. Either you know, he bans you know, and he follows the trend, which is you know, report negatively, you know, find the negative angle, find the sensationalist angle, or if he tries to put across something more truthful, more real, it's very difficult. India actually undersells itself. India is always going on about how people give it a bad image and that sort of thing. India should not care about that. India should worry about progressing on the same lines and India should be proud of what it's achieved but should also look honestly at its failures and try and do something about those failures. <laughs> years what India has been able to achieve in the form of uh, agriculture. We've been able to feed uh, 950 million people which is not an easy task with our agricultural revolutions. In industry we are about I think the ninth or tenth industrial most nation in the world, another great achievement. Then the question of computer science and technology, information technology, our network of communication throughout the country been remarkable. I always say that it's a country on the move. Uh, it's a country that is opening up. It's a country that's liberalizing. We waited a little long, but it has uh, happened. And I think it's uh, now India is, is really on the right, uh, on the in the global market, on the right uh, track. In these 25, 30 years, the world has become a small place. So we've all integrated. You know, there's more of the West in India. There's more of India in the West. There's so much more interaction with the entire world on all levels, whether it's business or craft or tourism or education. There's so much more traveling. There are people from outside here, people from here outside. I think that that's the biggest change in my experience. You know, so we've moved from 